Hey, thank you everyone for coming. I am very excited that you're here. I can see that there's a ton of people. Uh, we have over 130 people, So, and then the people keep coming in. So we have a big group of people. Before you get started, uh, before we get started, go ahead and fill out the poll questions that are down at the bottom of your screen. That way I can get an idea of what the demographic is. And uh, I just want to, you know, uh, recognize that, you know, that you guys coming to this webinar, this is at all, you know, you guys are all coming from different parts of the world. And so this represents for you some, you know, some pretty crazy times, like in Australia, we have some people from Australia, uh, and it's like four o'clock in the morning there. So thank you very much for coming. I uh, appreciate it. We have a lot of really fantastic information that we're going to be going over, and we are going to be, uh, and it's all actionable things. It's things that you can do right away. And then I'm going to be pointing you to some resources, some free resources, some paid resources, and then um, if you're familiar with the Matte Painting for Filmmakers project, uh, I've been working on a project for the last six months, and we're going to kind of reveal that at the end, that it's going to be branching out, not just a DMP and environment artist, to, but to other visual effects disciplines, like lighting effects and compositing. So let's go ahead and let's just jump right into our presentation here. So, Okay, so... The question that we're going to be talking about here is um, we're going to be talking about how do you break into visual effects. So just as an overview of what we're talking about, we're talking about the challenges that people face when breaking into visual effects, the misconceptions about getting into visual effects, uh, what the demo reel gap is and over how to overcome it, and what is missing from most visual effects job applications, and then we're going to do Q&A right at the end. Um, I, I, currently, I work for MPC. I, I, I go up there once a year, and I work for about six months teaching in their academy. And I just need to put a disclaimer here right at the beginning that I love MPC. I'm going to be talking about the cool things MPC does. But uh, the views and opinions expressed in this webinar are my own, and they don't necessarily reflect the official position or policy of MPC. So that's, my, that's just my little disclaimer there. Um, so just a little bit of information about me. Like I, um, I am the founder and trainer of the Matte Painting for Filmmakers project. And as a part of that project, I get to work with people who are preparing to get into visual effects. So that is through uh, the online uh, you know, courses, mentorships, and um, you know the Facebook community group, if you belong to that, we do the demo, uh, we do DMP challenges and demo reel reviews and stuff like that. So that's really cool to be a part of that. I'm also the 3D DMP Academy trainer. And uh, as part of that, if you're not familiar with what the 3D DMP Academy is at MPC, it's, um, and they do it for all disciplines, effects, um, compositing, lighting, it's an intense onboarding program for those who are interested in getting into visual effects. So they, they, MPC takes new graduates. They train them for 12 to 14 weeks as a paid uh, training. And then they get to finish out a year contract working on MPC shows after they graduate. And so um, I do some recruiting things, and, and, and then I teach in the academy. And so I get to kind of take people from preparing for visual effects and then get them trained so that they're working and they're on the job. So uh, I also am working as a 3D DMP lead. So I get to move with those people on the floor and work with them as their lead on visual effects shows. And so I believe that, you know, because I, I'm, I'm there for, you know, people getting into the industry, all these different steps that I have a kind of a unique view on the challenges that people face, and I get to be a part of, you know, the, the growing process that people go through in order to get into visual effects. Okay, so, uh, so let's talk about the big question that we have here is how do we break into visual effects? So, the, but first, before we get to that question, we need to talk about some of the misconceptions that people have when getting into visual effects. 
okay? Because really, um, if you're talking about having, like, you know, there's this problem of, of this breaking into visual effects. It's so difficult. And uh, you have to understand what the problem is before you can figure out what the cure is, right? So uh, what we're going to spend a big chunk of what we're talking about here, we're going to be talking about what the problem actually is. So let's go over. So the first misconception that people have um, is that the struggles of getting into visual effects is somehow this like visual effects rite of passage that, that you're made tougher by breaking into visual effects and it being this grueling, difficult process. So it's that kind of badge that artists can wear that say, hey, I deserve to be here. I put, I've been in the school of hard knocks uh, and, and, and I have a right to be here. So I, I disagree that the struggles that people get that have to go through to get into visual effects is actually beneficial to them. So if you were to look at, um, if you were to look at uh, somebody that graduates from school and has to spend a couple, you know, spending years trying to qualify themselves to get into visual effects job, their growth is quite level. Um, and uh, because, I mean, and it, and it makes sense, right? Because people that, you know, get that are not able to get into visual effects, they have to provide for themselves or their families. So they have to get full-time jobs. And now they're doing things, uh, you know, on the weekends and after hours, or maybe they're in an industry that doesn't really, is not what they want. And so they have a lot more limited time to work on the things that they uh, want to work on. Uh, if you compare that to somebody that uh, gets into visual effects right after school, then they have this exponential growth curve that that just happens, and it's it's um, uh, they grow very quickly. The demo reels get very good, and uh, so I I don't really see that struggling to get into visual effects is really beneficial for anybody. It's not beneficial for studios. It's not beneficial for artists. So really, we should be trying to make it so that people can get in to visual effects studios right after school. Um, another misconception about getting into visual effects is that uh, it's hard to get into visual effects because there's not a lot of jobs available, okay? So um, there's actually two areas that, that the industry is growing, and it's growing that more companies are using visual effects and the companies that have used visual effects in the past are using more and more visual effects. So let me just throw some numbers out to you. So visual effects work, um, if you look at it over time, uh, it used to just be feature films, but now feature films that did not use visual effects in the past, certain types of visual effects films, now those visual effects films are using visual effects as a normal part of their... Um, uh, their productions, and so uh, it becomes, uh, uh, it's more and more popular for more films to be using more visual effects. Independent films are re reaching out and using more visual effects. Cable networks, it's a, it's a really common thing for cable TV programming it, to be using visual effects just as a normal part of their production. And some uh, some productions, it's, you know, it's a major element of of their storytelling is use the use of visual effects. You also have uh, Netflix and Amazon. These companies, it's it's actually great when you go down on LinkedIn and you kind of scroll through um, some of the feeds there, and you can see studios that are uh, that are either popping up or being bolstered up by these Netflix Netflix original series and stuff. And that's fantastic to see that kind of growth and all these little studios that, that are taking on these Netflix original shows. Um, also, you know, AAA games have also, you know, they've dabbled in visual effects for, for a while. And as the, the more epic that these games become, the more they like to use visual effects. Um, and, uh, you know, and they like to tweak the visual effects so that, you know, they're doing things in, uh, in the game engine, right? And that's kind of the next big thing is game engine visual effects, which is pretty cool. Okay, so not only do we have projections that use 
uh, more productions use visual effects. We have a dramatic increase in visual effects uh, over time. So the, the productions that have used visual effects use way more. So if we take a look at 1999, uh, The Matrix it had 200, or 420 visual effects shots. So let's fast forward that to 2016 Captain America Civil War. There's 2,000 plus visual effects shots. So that is a huge increase from, uh, from The Matrix, which is, you know, I don't know, it doesn't seem like it was that long ago. So, um, and just to show you that the trend is still there, we have Guardians of the Galaxy that hasn't come out yet. Uh, uh, volume 2, 2,000 plus shots, uh, visual effects shots. So uh, that's kind of staying steady with that many visual effects shots. So that is a eye-popping 375% increase in the amount of visual effects that's happening. So uh, it's becoming more and more common. Studios are using it more. Uh, the, ta the, the, the directors want more of it. They, it's kind of, they expect it on their shows and viewers expect it in the shows, in the shows that they're watching. So recently at a VMX conference in 2016, uh, a, um, a Lionsgate representative, uh, said this, so she said, I'm starting to feel a little concerned about all the, how all the work is going to get done. I don't think there's enough visual effects artists out there to, to do all this work. So, um, so the studios, uh, you know, they're the ones that get to see, like, what is coming up, you know, what is in the queue for their productions. And even they are getting concerned that there's not enough visual effects artists. So um, in my own experience, in my, my own limited recruitment, you know, experience, I, I have seen that too. It's, it's difficult to get enough people to, to fill all of the spots, okay? So, all right, so another con uh, misconception is that making it easier to get into visual effects means a lot of underqualified artists are flooding into studios. So this is actually a concern that you may not have, but it's a concern that people that are in visual effects have. And where this is coming from is that these studios that are so desperate to get people to fill in these seats that they, uh, that they start hiring underqualified people. And what that does, and why current visual effects artists are concerned about that, is that it puts a, a weight on the senior level artists and they have to pick up a lot of the work and it makes it for very uncomfortable, <clears throat> excuse me, working conditions uh, to do that. And so, um, yes, that is actually a real concern. I think where the misconception comes in, just because we make it easier for people to get into visual effects doesn't mean that we have to compromise the visual effects standards. So that's something we don't want to do. We don't want visual effects studios to be lowering the standard of people being able to work on visual effects shows. Uh, but there are easier ways of doing it. Okay, so now that we've um, talked about some of these misconceptions, uh, you may be wondering, because I just told you, like, and you're coming from a place of, hey, I want to break into visual effects. That's why I'm here listening to this webinar. And now you're telling me that visual effects studios are desperate to hire people. And so on the one hand, we have people that are desperate for jobs. And on the other, you have studios that are desperate to hire. And so how in the world does that make sense? And that's why this problem is so crazy and weird that, that, and it doesn't make sense unless you understand it. And, and that's why we're spending time talking about what the problem really is. Because if you can understand the problem, you can come up with a cure. And, uh, and if you don't understand the problem, then you have, uh, you're doing things that's making you kind of go in circles and you're not making progress. So let's talk about what that real problem is. And so the, the real problem, the two things that we're going to be talking about is uh, a skills profile and a demo reel gap. So these are the two problems we're going to be talking about. So number one, skills profile. So the problem that a lot of people have is that they don't have the appropriate skills profile for their desired discipline, 
okay? So what I mean when I say skills profile, it's you want to be a compositor. There's a list of skills that you need in order to be a compositor or an effects artist or a DMP artist, okay? And so there's a lot of, actually, in this area, we're going to go over some good things that are kind of going for you here and some challenges that you face. So the good things that are in your favor as far as a skills profile goes is that the availability of training and the dissemination of information has just exploded recently. So, you know, when I was, you know, back in school, I was actually watching VHS tapes, you know, of training. Before that, you wouldn't even be able to get a hold of the software. The software wasn't even available to people, not to mention any kind of training. But like I was reaching out and looking at Nomen things and getting these VHS tapes. And then DVDs, it got cheaper. And now you had DVDs available. And so you go from DVDs to online subscriptions to, uh, to a lot of things are actually free right now. You go onto YouTube and you try to learn some Maya stuff. There's tons of information on how to use Maya, which is pretty amazing. Uh, that the, this dissemination of information, the software is more available. You can get your hands on it. Autodesk uh, like offers their software for free for people who are trying to um, learn the software. So that's really, really good. That is definitely good in your favor. Now, some of the challenges that you face is that these online uh, resources and online instructors and university instructors, they have a really hard time defining roles. So that's telling you exactly what does a compositor exactly do? What does an effects artist do? What does a matte painter, lighter, and so on and so on? What software do they need to know? What specialties? What, you know, so they have a really hard time defining the roles and the skills profile. And, and what that what happens because of that is that in all of these universities and educators, they're trying to appeal to a, a wide audience. And so um, they want you to come to their schools and, and, and they're trying to appeal to all of these disciplines. And so they come out with a really generalist education. Well, what you need is not necessarily a generalist education. It's great to have that generalist education, but you need to take it a step farther and you need to, to develop a specialist uh, education. And so uh, when you often, and I don't know if you've experienced this or not, but if you've gone to your, your professors or somebody that you are looking up to as, as the person that is going to be training you to be in visual effects, uh, and you ask them, what exactly do I need to know? They, maybe your experience has been that they say, I, I don't really know. I don't really know what they need. Um, uh, and and that's difficult. So, so educations tend to be very general, and then the education becomes very fragmented. Um, and so, uh, and so you go through your education process, or if you're done with your education, you know your formal education, and you're doing self education, then you go to this period of just kind of like trying to figure out exactly what that is. So, we're you know what we're going to talk about the the solution for this is to identify the needed skills profile for the discipline that you're interested in, okay? And um, the first step is to assess your current assets. And what I mean when I say current assets, it's, it's do you have mentors? Do you have uh, professors? Do you have people, friends in the industry? Who do you have that can help you identify the skills profile for your particular discipline? Uh, the next thing that you could do is go out and look at job listings. So um, there's not a lot of really great, um, you know, job listing websites for visual effects companies. I would go directly to the visual effects companies themselves. They often have, um, they often have, uh, you know, job boards there, and you can look and see what they are wanting for that particular job. That's a really great way. Uh, to give you insight on what that skills profile needs to be. Um, if the company that you're interested in doesn't have a job board or something, I would go ahead and email the recruiter and say, hey, I'm in, uh, I'm in this position and I want to qualify myself for this. Would you mind giving me some feedback and say, this is, what, is, what do you need for this particular position? And maybe you can get some uh, feedback that way. Um, I, I would warn you about this, though, uh, is that you have to look at a lot of different job postings for a particular job because 
um, sometimes these job postings are not being written by people that are the artists. Sometimes they're being written by HR, and so they can be a little off sometimes. And so uh, that's why to overcome that, if you look at enough job listings, you can kind of get an idea for you know what the general skills profile, and then you can eliminate some of the outliers for that. Um, you can reach out to professionals. So, um, uh, and uh, you can do that through like a mentorship, uh, a paid or informal or formal mentorship, people that are in the industry to do some kind of mentorship or just to reach out to them and ask them questions. So right now it's, it's easier now more and more to get connected with people, LinkedIn. Um, and, and let me just share with you just a little tidbit of information um, about LinkedIn. So uh, if you are able to um, get a nice, a nicer demo reel and you're able to get to connect with a recruiter um, because of your demo reel, then what, what that does for you is that recruiter has connections with a lot of people. Those recruiters, it's their job to be connected with people on LinkedIn. So they, they connect with everybody. And so uh, in a very short period of time, if you're able to connect with a bunch of recruiters, then your second LinkedIn uh, second to a lot of people in the industry. So if you can target those recruiters and get connected to them, then you're second to a lot of people in the industry. And now you can send invitation requests or linked requests to them. And uh, LinkedIn is a really, really great resource um, for connecting with professionals. You can chat people, you can email them, uh, and that kind of stuff. Um, so when you're interviewing, if you're able to get an interview, uh, with a company, some of the very best questions that you can ask is, what am I lacking? You're right there. They just looked at your demo reel, and you're asking them a direct question. So now they're in a position where they really have to give you feedback. Uh, another good question that you might ask is, what is preventing? what would prevent me from taking, from you giving me this job? And they can say, oh, well, you lack in this and this and this. And, and so they're able to give you real feedback. Um, that's as opposed to doing an interview and thinking, oh, I think I did well, and then just getting a notice back that says, oh, we're not interested. What you want, you really need feedback. So if you're able to interview a lot with people and get their feedback, then that will inform you about what you're lacking and what, you, what, what else you need. Um, also, you can get involved in an organization. Organizations like the Map Painting for Filmmakers Project that's targeted towards map painters and environment artists where that's the whole goal of that project is to define the skills profile of map painters and environment artists um, and, and, and kind of meeting a need that really isn't being met. And so I'm going to be pointing you to some resources for map painting and environment artists, but you can also use this as uh, a template. So if you're wanting to go into effects or environments or, or uh, effects or compositing or something, you can use these as a template to build your skills profile from. So I'll be, I'll be showing you those uh, in a minute. Okay, so um, the next thing is to come up with a plan and follow through. So um, if you're currently in school, and I can see by the polls here um, that there's a good chunk of you guys that are currently in school and some that have graduated from university, and so you're kind of all over the place there. But if you're in school, uh, then you need to come to turn. It's like an AA meeting where you have to acknowledge that something is wrong. So you're in school. You have to acknowledge that as you're going through the skills profile that your education, your your education, if that be online, if that be on uh, in a formal university setting, that it may not be giving you everything that you need for your skills profile. So you... Uh, after you've come to that realization, after you've done your research on your skills profile and you say, hey, this, I'm comparing that to my current education or my education that I've already finished, and I understand that that hasn't given me everything that I need. And so um, what, uh, what to do next is to look for resources outside of your education program. If you're not getting what you need in your education program, you have to look outside. You have to find some way to fill in the gaps. Um, 
and then you have to develop your own curriculum. And if you're currently in school or you're working and doing this part-time, then you have to develop a curriculum for yourself. Um, and so just a tip for those who are currently in school, I, um, I've done this a lot when I was in school. I, I did this. I developed my own curriculum because the school that I went to uh, was great and fantastic. It didn't offer matte painting as, uh, as a focus. And so I had to custom build my education with the classes that I picked. And then when I took those classes, I went to the teacher and I said, hey, I'm going to be a matte painter and I want... I know that you have this assignment that is this, and so, but can I tweak it? And it represents more work for myself. Uh, will you accept this as, uh, as an, a fulfilled assignment if I do this? And more often than not, people, uh, the professors are saying, hey, I, absolutely, why don't you go do that? That's great. And uh, there's only a few instances where I had professors that weren't on board with that. So uh, you can actually, even though you're in this like, you know, curriculum uh, and you're kind of bound to that, you, there's some flexibility for you to, to have control over that. So really what I'm describing through this whole process is that is, is, is an awareness, is an awareness that you may not be getting what you need. And you're basing that off of the skills profile that you've developed for your particular discipline. And you have to take charge of your education, either while you're in university or out of university or working, you, you have to take charge of that. So uh, that's the process of identifying the skills profile, identifying the resources that you have available to you, you develop a curriculum for yourself and a plan of execution. So that's like I'm working or I'm doing freelance work or whatever, and you're like, all right, I'm going to take weekends. I'm going to take, uh, take holidays. I'm going to work after hours. This is how I'm going to get this, this job done. And then all of this has to accumulate into a demo reel. Okay? So one of the biggest problems that – that people see on demo reels, uh, recruiters see on demo reels, is that, is that if they just look at your demo reel, they couldn't peg you as any one artist. So people have these generalist demo reels. They're a compositor, but they're putting like, uh, um, they're putting like, uh, uh, like skinned care, like three D models and and uh, you know rigged characters and stuff. If you're a compositor, you're not going to be spending any time rigging characters or anything like that. And so you have to have a targeted demo reel. You have to your skills profile that you've identified has to come out into your demo reel. It's good. It's an, it's good, and it's okay to have generalist work on your reel, and that's good to be putting at the end. But like right at the beginning, you have to make it absolutely clear that this is the position that you're applying for uh, and that you want. Okay, so uh, a couple of resources. Um, and like I said, these are targeted towards DMP artists and uh, map painters um, that, uh, that you can go to. So if you go to the Map Painting for Filmmakers web website forward slash profile, uh, there's a blog article, article that I created that actually defines what the skills profile is for a DMP artist and environment artist. Um, like if you're into compositing effects or whatever other discipline that you're doing, you can actually use that as a template. You read that through that and you'll be like, oh, okay, I need to fit my skills profile into something similar. Um, also, if you go uh, to forward slash demo reel, is a place where I've defined exactly what should be on junior demo rail. Um, and, and there again, you have to apply that to your specific discipline. Okay, so let's move on. Um, okay, so the next thing. So when we're talking about the skills profile, I, I think you guys really easily understand that. You guys know what a skills profile is. When you go to school or, the, you know, the job postings clearly say this is the skills profile that we want. So, so I think you guys, that's pretty easy to understand. Something that is not easy to understand is something called the demo reel gap. Um, and this is a real thing and a lot of people don't know about it. And it, uh, it's part of that, why can't I get a job? I don't understand why I'm not being, why don't companies see me as a good fit for their job. And so um, to illustrate this, I have this video here that I'm going to play for you. And the playback is probably not going to be that great. I'm going to make this video available to you guys uh, later. 
So this is um, uh, an artist that I worked with uh, who uh, was not in the visual effects industry, worked with him to get in the visual effects industry, and I asked him to put these two reels together. So that is his reel before visual effects, and then this is his reel after visual effects. So I put those um, together to kind of show you what the difference is. So this artist was about there for almost, uh, uh, I think, a little over a year um, in a, working in a visual effects studio, and this is the demo reel that he came up with. Okay, So I think you can see that there's quite a big difference um, after one year in visual effects. And so what does that mean for you? How does that impact you? So um, this is, uh, let me explain that to you. So if you have a demo reel uh, before you get into visual effects, then really what that represents is just your own work, right? So you, it's just your work. You don't have a team of artists. You don't have a production you're working on. It really is just typically it's your work. Um, if you work in visual effects, not only is it your work that's on your demo reel, but millions of dollars that have gone into the production. And so it has actors, it has sets, it has special effects, it has an army of visual effects artists that have worked on the shot that you are showing on your demo reel, right? If you're the compositor, you didn't build the models, you didn't do the effects work, you didn't do any of that. You just composited the shot, but because you worked on the film, you get to show that on your demo reel. And the, what the problem comes in is that recruiters, I, I guess you could say recruiters don't really have that great of an imagination. They, they look at feature film quality work all day long, and, and that's what they compare your reel to, bef your before visual effects reel. And so, and it's just your work. You don't have access to millions of dollars and an army of visual effects artists, but what that does is it creates uh, a huge gap, okay? And it's, and it's wide and it's large and it's treacherous and a lot of people don't make it, right? So, and, and that's really unfortunate. Um, and the people that are able to bridge that gap are considered people who have broken into visual effects, right? And so um, you have this huge gap, but then also what happens sometimes when people are able to, and people are surprised because they hear this, hey, I've broken into visual effects. I got my first job. It's awesome. I love it. And then after your first job is done, then you have something that's called, uh, that stands in your way of getting your career in visual effects is like the big slump. So some of you guys have, have finished up your first job in visual effects and you're like, why can't I get my next job? It's like I'm having to break into the industry again. And it's tough. And, and that is the, that's the slump. After your first job in visual effects, sometimes there's a slump. Sometimes people can smoothly move on and it goes into their career. Some people experience a slump. And that can be really, really difficult. So um, I have two videos here. I haven't, in a public setting like this, I haven't kind of told my origin story. But like I wanted to take this opportunity to talk to you guys because I think it really illustrates this, what I just talked about, this idea of a demo reel gap and a slump, okay? So um, let's go ahead and play this video. Here on the left, um, I was working, while I was in school, I worked for a nonprofit organization that was putting together these Bible videos, and they were using real film and actors and sets and props, and I found this plate, and it wasn't being used by the production, and I was like, I'm going to make a demo reel piece off of this. And this is what I created from that. And it is that one demo reel piece that made it so that I could get into the industry. So, like, if you look at that, it has a lot of production value, right? It, it, uh, it has uh, tents and, and wind blowing, and it looks expensive. So it actually looked like I worked on a visual effects show. So, um, uh, and so, like I said, it was that one shot of, amongst my demo reel that really made it so I could get a job. So uh, let's fast forward. So I'm working at a games company um, in Utah for, um, for a couple of months, and then I get a call from uh, Matt World Digital. And Matt World Digital in San Francisco area, um, they were working on the Curious Case of Benjamin Button. 
and you can see from this reel. So I worked on that show for three months. And, uh, and from that, I got a lot of work on my demo reel. Um, throughout that process, I worked with a team of artists and some fantastic artists and um, and I got great art direction and uh, it was a really great experience, fantastic studio. Unfortunately, Matt World Digital has uh, closed uh, since then um, uh, in, in, in way of more modern visual effects, you know, studios. Um, so I'm gonna, I'll make also this video, I'm just gonna fast forward this just a pieces just so you can get an idea. Um, so before visual effects, I was just some dude working at a game company, okay? And then after visual effects, um, uh, my work was shown in Cinefx Magazine. So I worked in the industry for three months. My work was shown in Cinefx Magazine. And I share this with you not to, not to brag about myself, but to show you how fickle the VFX industry is. So um, I... Uh, my work was featured in Cinefx Magazine. The show that I worked on won an Emmy for Best Visual Effects. And all of a sudden, within three months, I become a rock star, right? Or that, at least that's how I felt. I felt like I was a rock star. But really, when you think about it, like the work that I did on Curious Case of Benjamin Button, yes, I did a lot of work on that show. Um, but it wasn't all my work. I had a bunch of VFX artists. I had a CG artist that was building these environments for me, and I was doing the map painting work, and we worked together, and it was awesome. And and uh, and not only that, like I I my boss there on the right, Craig Barron, um, he was sitting down with me all the time and telling me how to make my work better. And so, uh, and then you know the reason why it won an Oscar and was featured in Cinefx magazine was because of all the work the Digital Domain guys did on these face replacements for Brad Pitt. So, um, but you know I say this and I felt like a rock star. But then after my first job in visual effects, I had a slump. Like I went through a period of time where I was living off my savings and I couldn't get a job, and uh, I had to break into visual effects again and. <laughs> It was very difficult. I mean, I went through all of my savings and, and it just, you know, it, all the different options represented moving to different, uh, different cities and, and states. And, and it, was a, it was a difficult thing for us, but we were able to get a job. Um, and thankfully for us, it was at a studio, a startup studio, Image Movers Digital. They are also closed. <laughs> so unfortunately, they're not around anymore either. But um, so we're back to the same question. So that story kind of illustrates the problem that people have when they, they're getting into visual effects. So we're back at this question. People are desperate for jobs and studios are desperate to hire. So how, what, what, what's the solution for this? So we could ask you know, studios to lower their demo reel standards uh, and their skills profile standards. Uh, but we know that that's going to, we talked about that before, it's going to put a lot of pressure on senior level artists and make it difficult for studios to do business. And so that's not a good option. Um, we can say that we would like visual effects studios to do more on the job training. Um, uh, MPC is really fantastic. They're the only studio uh, that is really embracing a, an aggressive program for doing on the job training. Um, all the other studios have a, a bit of a mentality of, um, you know, in order to work for us, you need to have visual effects experience. And you say, how do I get visual effects experience? And they say, uh, go work at a visual effects company. And you go, well, I can't get a job because I don't have visual effects experience. How am I supposed to get a job? And they're just like, uh, I don't know, call me when you have visual effects experience. And that's a little bit of the industry because, um, because, because, it's difficult to do visual effects for feature film. And a lot of times those companies, you know, we can't blame them because they're working on such these margins and it's, it's difficult to do the work. And so they're just looking for people to plug in and, and work on their shows. Um, so you can say, hey, yeah, we wanna, we wanna, let's rely on visual effects companies to do training programs. MPC, the only reason they're able to do it is that they're the largest VFX company in the world and they have the infrastructure and, and everything in place in order to do it. So, so they're unique, but, but through the hundreds of people that they put through the academy, 
Um, and that academy, I can just tell you, is effects, compositing, lighting, and 3D DMP. So for those four disciplines, um, there's still a limited number of seats, and you still have to qualify to get into those. And so it's very difficult. There's a big question mark there, right? You don't know if you can get into those programs, and you don't know if you can, you know, uh, you can work getting into, um, excuse me, you can, uh, if your country you know, you can go from your country into Canada and Canada will support your work permit and stuff like that. So there's a big question there, right? Um, so you, on the other hand, you can say, hey, there's going to be a lucky break. I'm going to hold on to that lucky break and and I'm just, I guess just got to wait for that to happen. So the problem with that is anytime you have a lucky break of breaking in the industry and that can come in the form of uh, like an internship or uh, on the job training or you get you get a job that you're not necessarily qualified for that you really like work crazy hard uh, to show them that you've you know you've got the stuff right um, but that is really it sits outside the circle of your influence you can't really control lucky breaks you can only be in a position to grab lucky breaks when they come by right so there's a big question mark there <clears throat> So what is the real thing that you can do? The real thing you can do is that your demo reel needs to look better. You need to bridge the gap between your before visual effects demo reel and your feature film, de uh, feature film effects demo reel. So, <clears throat> so let's talk about that. Let's talk about the six things that are missing, uh, common things that are missing from people's demo reels. So the first one that we have here is skills profile. We talked about that before, where people are applying for something. They apply to be a compositor, but but they have uh, animation stuff on their reel, so it doesn't really fit. Um, there's that's a really that's a big that's an example of like a, a big uh, disparity of skills profile, but it 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 gets even more finite. It's this, so that, you know, if you're working in effects, then you need to have certain types of simulations on your reel for them to know that you can do the job. And so um, if you just have uh, particles and you don't have any fluids, then, then that's a problem, right? So, um, so it's really uh, catering your skills profile to match the particular job that you're wanting. Um, the second one is live action footage. Um, a lot of the demo reels that I review and that I have seen that where people are trying to break into um, uh, visual effects, it, there's a lack of live action footage. If you're going into live action uh, visual effects, then it's a good idea to have live action footage on your demo reel. The challenges with that is that it can be kind of expensive to get live action footage on your demo reel. I mean, you could go out there and shoot with your iPhone or something, right? But that looks amateurish and it kind of leads to the next one. If you do have live action footage on your demo reel, it's common that that live action footage has low production value. It looks like you just went out with, a, with an iPhone, you know? And then you're like, okay, well, I need to go buy an expensive camera and I need to process that footage and, and then all this kind of stuff. And you're at a point where you're like, I don't need to know how to work a camera and stuff. I'm I'm an effects artist, so why do I need to to learn all this stuff? And normally on the job you don't do that. You don't go out and shoot your own footage. You have a crew of professionals that do that for you, and then these shots just show up on your on your lap. And so uh, so you get to this point where you're like, oh, I could go out there and I could shoot my own footage and stuff. But then you're you're like, okay, that's taking time away from me actually working in doing, focusing on my skills profile that's for my particular discipline. So that's a challenge for people. Um, and the next one also is, is, is another challenge, is that on your demo reel, you have a lack of resources. Um, when you're working in film, there's a, ton of, um, there's a ton of money that's being spent on handing you resources, right? If you are you know, a map painter, somebody has gone out, and uh, potentially has shot reference footage. There's uh, people in the modeling department that's modeled and textured stuff for you to take on. There's, um, there's shot footage, there's track 3D cameras, there's all these things that just kind of hand, that are handed to you on a plate here when you go to work at a visual effects studio. You don't have that. When you, when you don't work at a visual effects studio, who's doing all that work for you? Um, and so that's a difficult thing for you to overcome because, because you don't have access to all those things. Okay, so the next one is appropriate scope. 
Um, and what I mean when I say this is that is that oftentimes when people are trying to get into visual effects, they watch these visual effects shows and they say, that is the shot that I want to reproduce on my demo reel. And, and inevitably the shot that they pick is like the most expensive, difficult shots that they take on. So uh, they don't realize that they're just one person and they don't have millions of dollars and a crew of visual effects artists. They try to take on the most difficult shots. So those most, most difficult shots are very hard and they're typically done by senior uh, visual effects artists that have been in the industry for 10, 15 years. And so somebody new says, okay, I'm going to do a really expensive shot and it's going to be a senior level shot. And then inevitably what happens is that that senior level shot turns out to not be very good. And because you're doing not very good senior level shots doesn't make you a good junior, if that makes sense. You need to be doing junior level shots and executing them very well in order for you to be considered for a junior level position, if that makes sense. So, um, so uh, when you go to online educators and universities and stuff, they're very bad at, at helping you manage the scope of the project that you're working on. So either the scope is so gigantic, huge, or they give you no direction at all, and you're left to just figure out like what what to do, and so you're off, and you're in, in your you kind of uh, you know waste a lot of time trying to figure it out, and then uh, and then once you kind of get a project going, there's nobody there to say uh, here's some art direction. So there's two types of art direction. So there's art direction on the project, and there's art direction on your particular work. So if you're going out and you're like, hey, I'm going to uh, do some work and this is the scope of the work that I'm going to do and I'm going to put it on my demo reel, nobody's there to say, hey, that's a really good idea or no, hey, maybe you should tweak it like this. And then, so that's a challenge, but also there's not a lot of resources for people to get feedback on their demo reels. So uh, those are some of the things that are inherently difficult for people. Those six things are inherently difficult uh, for people to to fill out a good demo reel, and so the question is, uh, what is it that we, that, what is it that you can do? So, um, I just knowing the problem uh, is, you know, half the battle for you. So now that we've gone through and talked about some of the problems, now you can say, this is how I'm going to find a solution. Okay, and the solution may be for you to go out and shoot your own footage to develop your own skills profile, to make sure that footage has production value, that you have resources, that you have the appropriate scope, that you're resourcing people so that you can have the appropriate art direction <clears throat> for your projects. And not just art direction at the beginning, but art direction at the very, uh, excuse me, not art direction at the end, but at the very beginning as well, so that you know that the project that you're working on has uh, production value and taste and, and looks appropriate. So um, the problem with that is that Nobody is catering to you in your effort to build a demo reel. If you think about it, you go to online courses or to university classes and everybody's working on the same shot, okay? And uh, Or there's tutorials or things like that. So nobody is trying to get you to have a good demo reel. They want to teach you. Everything that they learn is focused on skill building, they don't say, hey, you need to come out of here with a good demo reel and it needs to be unique and it needs to look good. So um, there's not a lot of resource out there. So you're kind of left on your own. You need to go out there. You need to battle it out. And I think uh, uh, overwhelming, the things that you should take away from this presentation is that, is that you need to take charge of, of your career and your education. And, and probably many of you have already been doing that. And actually, you're here for this webinar. That means that you are taking charge. You didn't have to be here. You know, people didn't tell you, you know, it was not an assignment or, or a requirement for work or something like that. You're here. So you are taking charge of your education. And if you haven't made those steps that I've already talked about, you're on the path to doing that. So, uh, and, so and I hope that this has been beneficial for you to see uh, the way that you could do that. Okay. 
So now, now that you understand that there are some difficulties and things to overcome, I, I want to present to you an option for you. So uh, this is something that I've been working on for the last six months. And so, like I said, I work for MPC for six months out of the year, and then the other half of the year, I'm working for the Matte Painting for Filmmakers Project, and, um, and I'm developing this new resource. And this new resource is not geared towards uh, map painters and environment artists specifically, but to all visual effects disciplines. So um, it's called the VFX Horde. So the VFX Horde is an online uh, resource that simulates a working visual effects environment that bridges the gap, uh, bridges the experience and the demo reel gap. So what this uh, site is to do, it's is to give you access to live action footage that has production value, to give you resources like tracked 3D cameras, 3D models, elements for compositing, all these things that you would need to, in order to do shots. Because if you're working a visual effects studio, you don't have to go get the stuff yourself. So that's what this website is. It's to simulate a working environment, art direction, and targeted training for, uh, for uh, these sequences. So, um, so the, the disciplines that this is, uh, is being targeted towards is uh, 3D digital map painting, compos compositing, lighting, and effects. So, um, so let's go ahead. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of break this presentation. So, uh, and then I'm going to head over. If you guys go to, and you guys can go, go to this right now, and if you go over to the tab um, at the bottom of your screen, I turned on the offers. So if you go to that, there's some links right there that will take you to these pages, uh, to some of these sequences. So I, I'm going to just take a little bit of time here and walk you, uh, walk you through uh, the website and how it's structured, and then uh, and then you can kind of like you know breeze through it. So um, if you click on this link right here, uh, then you'll get an idea of some of the sequences that are being offered for. Uh, spring 2017 and um, they're all all the film that's being shot is is at high quality it's at 2k resolution and it's done on professional cameras and um, and the whole point of it is that you know they're 32b 32 bit exr they're uh, 24 frames per second which simulates a film environment and uh, they're available for you to use so you can go through and you can check that out. I'm going to end this uh, video early so you can, you can look through that on your own. If you take a look here, there's six sequences that are available in, in their associated disciplines. And so um, there's underpass, shipyard, cemetery, construction site, alleyway, and cityscape. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, let's check out the cemetery uh, sequence here. So here's the cemetery sequence. Uh, you can see that the discipline right here is uh, digital map painting. Um, right now, uh, the, the VFX Horde website is going to be expanding. These same sequences are going to be available in compositing, lighting, and effects. Right now, uh, there's the things that are available are for 3D digital map painting, but it will be growing into those other disciplines. Um, hopefully soon. So um, here is the cemetery sequence. So if you just play that, you can see right here, um, I am the lead for the sequence. Um, and um, as part of my lead responsibility for the sequence, I, and you watch this video, it's giving you a sequence brief. So it's saying, here are all the shots for the sequence. This is what you need to do uh, for the sequence, and then I go through some of the resources. So let's go ahead and fast forward that. Um, here's some of a preview of some of the shot briefs. So every shot has its own shot brief to say what exactly needs to be done. There's specific targeted training on how to complete the, uh, the things that are needed for these sequences. And then uh, resources are made available to you. So particularly like for this 
discipline, there is, uh, for 3D digital map painting, there's photo reference that's available. Um, let's go ahead and fast forward. There's 3D photo scanned models that you can use. And so you can take the approach of, hey, I'm going to be a DMP artist, more focus on DMP artists. I'm going to do projections and I'm going to use photography mostly for my setups. Or you can say, hey, I'm going to be uh, an environment TD. So I'm going to take these high resolution images and the photogrammetry setups with all the cameras. And I'm going to build out um, uh, like really high res models. And that's what I'm going to use for the sequence. So um, you can see down here on the right, uh, this is the uh, sequence, the image photo sets, um, the, the different uh, photogrammetry models that are available, um, and, and stuff like that. So when you get, when you're working on this sequence, you have access to all of these files. Um, gravestone facades for photo modeling, photo, photogrammetry image sets. So there's really a, a lot that's available. So here are all the different shots. Um, and if you click on these, you'll be brought up and it will show you um, the specific shot brief for that shot and says, hey, this is what needs to be done, um, just like you would be at a visual effects studio. So this kind of feedback and art direction kind of help, it helps you uh, target so, so that you can focus in on making your stuff look good. And, and it kind of levels the playing field so that you don't have to, you know, you don't have to do everything yourself, you know? You can just focus on your discipline and do what people do when they're in visual effects studios. So uh, if we click on one of those, um, this here is, uh, this is the shot right here. You can see down here, it's a cemetery sequence. 3D digital map painting is the, is the discipline. And this is the shot right here. And then this shot has specific files for this shot. So um, the footage for download, the shot camera, the lens distortion, everything that you need uh, for this particular shot. So I'm just going to take a moment and just go through some of these. This is uh, the cityscape. Uh, the cool thing about this one is that you get to, it's the same location shot at multiple times a day so that you can, you can show that you can integrate something or change the city skyline and you can use the same element, but relight it for different times of day, which is an awesome thing to put on your demo rail to say, hey, I can do this on my demo. I, I can do this. Um, and then with this, you have access to um, a bunch of different um, uh, image sets, uh, gigs of, of pho photography shot from a bunch of different cities around the world, Sydney and New Orleans and uh, uh, Vancouver and different places like that. Uh, the alleyway sequence, uh, this one has these kind of like dark and moody uh, shots of these alleyways. And what you're to do on these shots is fill them up with garbage and grime and add additional doorways and windows and uh, things like that. And you have access to all of these things down here. Even ink blots, which is pretty cool, uh, old school matte painting thing to use for masks to add grime and stuff to the walls. Uh, but then you have... Um, door sets uh, that you can use to integrate um, into your footage. Um, we have a construction site here, where, uh, which is pretty cool, that you can integrate your objects with alongside you know, live people and, and uh, focusing on the integration of your elements uh, into these shots. So uh, that's pretty cool. Um, there's a shipyard sequence here um, where uh, available to you there is um, some high resolution uh, you know shipping container assets that you can put in you can render you can uh, lay out uh, for these particular shots uh, which is pretty cool too um, and uh, and then this underpass sequence here um, where uh, you need to add, replace the backgrounds on all of these with an industrial landscape and provided there's two image sets um, of industrial landscape photography that you can use to replace and to put back there. 
Um, and then in addition, you have uh, barricades uh, that you'll be placing in these scenes, these uh, photogrammetry 3D models that you can use uh, to render in light and to put into your scenes. Um, and then, of course, for every shot, there is specific art direction uh, for all of these. So that kind of gives you an overview of what the VFX Horde website is all about. And, um, uh, and so let's go back to the presentation. Um, so yeah, so, uh, the, so I know that that's a lot of information to process. I want to give you guys some time to look over the website and make a decision if that is a good resource uh, for you to take advantage of. And just to give you some information on that, um, the sequences won't be available until fall 2017, but I want to give access, early access to people who pledge. So if you think of it kind of like a crowdfunding thing, um, I've been working on this project for the last six months. I, um, I, I think it really fills a need in the VFX industry. And and uh, so I would like to give people early access. So these sequences are ready to go. All the assets are there. The only thing that's missing is the targeted training, which I'm going to complete after I do the academy. And, the, uh, and so uh, I'm going to be going to the academy in May and teaching in the academy at MPC in Montreal. And then, and then I'll be coming back and then I'll be jumping right into these. So I want to be able to give you guys early access um, to people that are interested and some of the benefits for pledging for these is that you can get early access to these sequences. You can get 20 plus discount uh, on these sequences. Uh, there's certain pledge levels. And so at a certain pledge level, um, I will uh, be holding daily sessions to further simulate a visual effects environment where I do critiques on people's work. Um, and that will be going until uh, the training becomes available in the fall. And then you get automatic, you get access to all the training and you get to support the VFX Horde. So uh, that's a big plus, um, uh, I think. And so, um, yeah, so if, if in the comment box, if you guys have any uh, questions um, for me uh, about the VFX Horde uh, website, uh, let's go ahead and just take a moment to answer that. So in the comment box, if you guys have any questions, go ahead and... Um, and ask that. So somebody asked uh, the amount for pledging and stuff. So next week, I'm going to be um, I'm going to be uh, uh, presenting. You know what what that means as far as uh, getting access to these sequences and the pledge levels and stuff like that. And so wait for that. I'm going to make that available to you guys. I'll I'll go ahead and I'll send that out to everybody. Um, and. Some people are asking about when VFX will be available, when lighting will be available. Um, uh, those, uh, uh, those will become available when um, we're, the VFX Horde takes on more uh, trainers. And so uh, when this is made public now, um, we're going to be looking for trainers to, to fill in these positions. And it's a great thing, actually, for trainers. It's a good thing for trainers, and it's a good thing for people who are looking to get into visual effects. Because oftentimes, the people that are best qualified for, uh, to teach visual effects are the ones that don't have a lot of time um, because they're currently working in the industry. So... Um, those people, uh, they, they get to work on these sequences where they already have project files. If, and I've created Nomen DVDs before and other trainings, and it takes a lot of time. You have to build everything from scratch uh, to do these trainings. But these trainers, these lighters and effects artists and compositors, they have access to this footage that they can base their training off of, and it makes it easier for them. And so you're going to get better trainers in these disciplines, which is pretty cool. Um, let's see the questions. Let me take a look here. Uh, so yeah, so I think I may have answered a lot of those questions. Um, uh, so yes, there will be a pledge level that will give you access to all of the sequences. Um, and so that will be, I'll, I'll be revealing that, you know, next week, you know, as a part of, um, as a part of the launch. But, you know, I, I guess, uh, 
Um, there will be, uh, somebody's asking, or is there going to be another meeting to talk about, uh, the, the pledge levels? Um, right now there's not, um, it's, uh, I'm going to do a pitch video. So I think at the very least, if you guys are going to be kind of investing in the VFX horde and getting access to these sequences that you deserve a pitch video. So um, I'm going to develop a, a video that talks about all the different pledges. And so you get a real clear understanding of how all this is going to work. And so um, I, I'm going to develop that and then, and then make that available to you. Um, and then you can just go out and do that. Um, so pledging, uh, pledging will be open next week. So somebody, somebody is asking that. Okay. So uh, do, 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 do. All right, so um, I'm going to, uh, I think that's probably, uh, uh, yes, I will announce this to the Matt Painting for film, Filmmakers mail list. I'll make it as public as I possibly can, so when that becomes available. Um, okay, so I think, I think that's probably enough time talking about the VFX for If you, Of course, if you guys have any questions, you just email me directly. Uh, one of the things that I try to do is I try to make myself available to people. So uh, go ahead and email me if you have questions. Um, or connect with me on social media. So um, real quick, I know that we're getting past an hour and um, I do, like I collected a bunch of people's questions before uh, we did this webinar. And so I'm gonna try to hit some of those um, and I've kind of collected them all into, into you know, categories. And so I'm hopefully I'll be able to kind of shotgun approach all of these questions for you uh, and make them. Uh, and so to kind of clear up any questions that you have. Okay. So, uh, and I'm going to try to do these really quick because I know that probably some of you guys need to go. So, uh, can I work in visual effects remotely? Um, it's not a part of my experience as a professional VFX artist to work remotely. So, uh, I, uh, I have heard of people doing that. Um, I think that people that do do that are working for um, uh, commercials and uh, smaller productions and things like that. Um, I've never known anyone to work for a large VFX studio and, and be able to work remotely. And there's several reasons for that. And it's because, um, for one, uh, security is such an issue. So like Fox Studios or Universal, these 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 production companies, they impose very, very strict security on visual effects studios, so much so that sometimes it is, it is uh, debilitating. And so um, to be able to work remotely, that means that you're, you're passing information, it's leaving the studio uh, and then coming back to the studio. And so that, that poses a security risk for them. And so uh, if you're doing something like commercials or something, a production that, you know, they don't, they don't, that's not such an issue, then you could possibly do that. Um, other things is that you're tied into the VFX pipeline so much. Every discipline now is, is really tied tightly into the VFX pipeline. And so in order to review things, um, to get feedback and things like that, you kind of have to be on site. And so, um, I, uh, that's my opinion, but I would suggest that the people that are interested in working in VFX remotely, that you reach out to somebody that has actually done that. I haven't done it, so I can't give you, I can't tell you, I can just tell you what I, my experience is. And so, uh, go for a second opinion, go out and find somebody that has been doing this. Um, and then, uh, and then actually, once you find that out, you should make it available to all of us. Uh, which would be pretty awesome. Okay, so uh, the next uh, the next question is, where are the film hubs? So this is kind of a series of questions here. The film hubs, where a lot of VFX a lot of VFX companies like go together. So if you go to like London, uh, I think it's the Soho area. I haven't worked in London before, but like in the Soho area, there's all these visual effects studios. You go to Vancouver, you go to Montreal, they're all like actually physically close together. So in Montreal, you can actually walk to Rodeo FX, you can walk to Framestore from MPC. Uh, they're all really close together. And they do that because they want to pool the talent. Um, they want all the talent to live in Montreal or Vancouver or Sydney or whatever, so that that they have availability of artists. And these artists can, can studio hop. They can go from one studio to the next studio. 
So if you are able to make uh, the move to these film hubs, it helps out a lot. So uh, a bit of the outliers for some of these companies is that there's actually some really amazing studios that are not in these film hubs. They're in Europe and different places, and they're these little boutique studios, and they're doing fantastic, amazing work. And so you'll definitely look up those, but but really they're kind of like the only studio in town. Like, for instance, um, I worked for Rising Sun Pictures in uh, Adelaide, Australia. Fantastic company. They do great work. But they're the only company in Adelaide, Adelaide that I'm aware of. And so... Um, uh, so you can find little, little stu- smaller studios that do fantastic work in these little, these little areas. And so that's something to consider. So the next question is, how do I get a job in another country? So this is a pretty difficult one. If you're wanting to... Um, uh, <laughs> nobody likes Adelaide. <laughs> okay. Um, so if you, if you want to go work in a different country, then... Um, uh, the more qualified you are, the more willing a company is willing to pay to relocate you and to pay for you to get into a different country because there's a lot of expenses and and things that are associated with relocation. And if they know that you're going to pay off for them as a company, then they're going to want to they'll upfront that money for you. And so uh, something like the Academy, un- like I was super, super sad. There's a bunch of people that I wanted to be in the the Academy, a 3D DMP Academy this year that were rejected uh, because uh, of visa requirements and stuff like that, it just was cost prohibitive, I guess, or or not possible. And I don't, and I don't know the details because I don't, uh, you know, there's all these legal things, and so you can't really take my advice on this as 100%. But but the these, it's difficult to get people to work, and and different countries have different requirements. You have to be a VFX professional. You have to be uh, something that the current market can't provide you know uh, you have to the company has to show that there's a great need in order for the government to issue a work permit and all that kind of stuff and so um so it's that's kind of a hairy question and and so the best thing that you can do is i mean you have two options get a really awesome demo reel and try to make yourself avail like make yourself so attractive that people can't turn you down or you know you could try to make a move to one of these film hubs that's inherently uh risky you know because anytime you make a move into a different country and you're like uh i paid for my own work permit but but and what if i can't get a job and all that kind of stuff the real upside to that is is that companies are a lot like a lot more likely to hire you if you have your own work permit and you're there um if you're like, I can start work tomorrow, then they'll, then they're a lot more likely to do that. So, uh, but like I said, big warning on that. It's, it's, uh, mo- you know, moving to a different country without a job is, is, can be a really scary thing. Um, I can just kind of put in a plug here the, about these film hubs. I absolutely love traveling and I've lived in, uh, Wellington, New Zealand, Sydney, Australia, Adelaide, Um, uh, I've worked in Vancouver and Montreal and so, uh, and in California. And so I, my family and I, we love to travel. And so, um, anytime we go to a new place, we just live it up. So we really, really like it, uh, and enjoy it. So, um, that's kind of my plug for that. Um, so what language do I need to speak? So, um, visual effects is predominantly English. So, um, uh, if English is not your first language, then you, it's, it's good that you can develop your, your English speaking skills. Like for instance, MPC, even though they're in Quebec and, uh, everybody speaks French there, uh, MPC is an English speaking company and, uh, all official business is done in English. Uh, people that struggle with English that, uh, that speak French can usually get by just fine because everybody else speaks French. But all official business is done in 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 uh, English. So, um, but you know, if you're working at some of those boutique studios, like in Europe and stuff like that, then there's not those same requirements for English. Uh, okay, uh, am I too old to get into visual effects? Okay, I had uh, a couple of these uh, questions, and um, it's not really a question of uh, am I too old to get into visual effects um, because so, like typically uh, you don't see a lot of people that are older getting into visual effects because 
uh, usually they're coming from a place where they have a career. They have a career somewhere, they're getting paid a certain amount, and then and then they're jumping they're jumping careers. And this and it's not it's not unique to visual effects. It happens to any industry that where you're jumping from uh, from uh, um, career to career. You immediately go from the top of the current career that you're at and you go right to the bottom as a junior level artist. And so as a junior level artist, uh, you have to take, you typically take a pay cut and you typically uh, have to, you know, you have to like put in the time, you know, before you're considered, you know, a senior level artist. And so, um, so I, I guess I wouldn't be asking the question, am I too old? It would be, am I willing to uh, take a pay cut? Am I willing to work long hours to build myself up in a new career and things like that? I think it's totally doable to people, and I think it's just an individual thing. I think you just have to ask yourself, um, what is it that that I can, you know, what is it that I can do? So I hope that answers that question. Um, okay, so uh, how can I maintain a career path after I get into visual effects? So you know that whole slump that I was telling you about after your first job in visual effects, the slump? Um, I, uh, I think after getting all of your questions and stuff and seeing the concerns that you guys have, I think I'm going to have to put together uh, another webinar that talks about how to succeed on your first job, how to overcome that lump, how to line up future jobs, and how to best network. Um, uh, this stuff is super, super important and crucial because, uh, because as a visual effects artist, you don't have a company that is going to be looking after you all the time. You're a contractor. You're, you're doing contract work. So that means you're responsible for lining up your next job uh, or for staying with the company that you're working at. And so there's a lot of, um, uh, a lot of things to consider when you're talking about how do I get in my career path, which we've talked about, but how do you stay in it? Um, and how are you successful in it? Um, and, uh, you know, there are people that, that never have a break in work. They're always in demand because they do certain things uh, with their career uh, and certain techniques. So I'm going to have to put, I, I want to have to put that question on hold because that is a very deep topic and I think deserves its own webinar. So, okay. So that kind of concludes all of the questions that, uh, that I um, uh, that I got. And, um, I want to thank you, uh, very, very much for, uh, attending the webinar. We had, uh, close to 200 people attend to this webinar, which is super awesome. Thank you guys all for, uh, doing this and, um, uh, thank you for your questions. And so, um, I am going to make this video available to you. I'm going to put it on YouTube. Uh, that may have been like a big information dump so that it's just, uh, so if you have missed anything, that's going to be available to you. And all, there's a lot of people that weren't able to make it. So it'll be made available to them too. Um, and, uh, if you have any more questions on that repost, of that video, if I go through the questions, because I got addition, I got some more questions, uh, and so after uh, after I put out this video, if I find more questions that I missed or didn't didn't get, um, then uh, then I'm gonna try to include that in that video, and then we're gonna do follow up videos, right? We'll do more webinars like this because it's super cool um, to connect with you guys and stuff. So um, thank you very much. I appreciate your guys' time. I'm gonna sign off now, and uh, good luck with everything that you guys are doing.